of today's video. Uh, in it, I'm going to introduce you to critical path analysis. Um, so the rest of this topic, we're going to focus on critical path analysis. Um, and before we get to that, uh, before we get to critical paths um, and the works, we just need to know what these particular networks are um, and a couple of the key definitions. Um, as well as that, I'm going to show you how we draw them. So the first thing that we need to accomplish, we need to be able to do well, is to be able to draw what these networks look like. Um, and we're drawing it from something called a precedence table. So to begin with, these activity networks are basically a network that represents the steps that are in a project. So say you had a project that was to build a house, there are a number of steps that are involved in that. So obviously laying the foundation, there would be, um, I guess, a range of different things like laying a concrete slab might be one of them. Some of these things need to be done before others. So sometimes um, you might need to say, um, put the roof on the house before you can lay the tiles on that roof, for example. So not only do we have a number of steps, we actually have a particular order that those steps must be done in. And that's what the network is going to show you. It's going to show you what has to be done before other things can be done. Okay, the reason we do them is to organise jobs. It's to organise these, um, these projects so that they run more efficiently. We want to do a job in the minimum time possible because that is going to potentially save money. When we are drawing these, there's some key things that we need to remember. And that is that the edges are going to represent individual activities that are taking place. So my example before, like laying a concrete slab for a house, that's one activity in the whole project. So in the network, that would be represented by an edge. The vertices themselves, that's just where an activity is going to start and finish. So it's actually not going to represent anything else other than a starting and an end point. You're going to have one vertex where the activity or where the project starts and one where the project is complete. You're only going to have one edge connecting um, a pair of vertices, so multiple edges and loops. We're, not, we're never going to have a loop, but you might have a multiple edge occasionally, and we, we do have a way of avoiding that, and I'll show you shortly. The tables, that's going to show you what, is, um, what, is a, what we call a predecessor of an activity. It's going to tell you what has to be done before another activity can be done. So if an activity is a predecessor, it means it has to come before it. It has to be completed before the next one can start. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, these are listed here. All activities that don't have a predecessor, so it means they don't have anything that needs to be done before it, they're going to start at the beginning, so they're going to be at the start vertex. And if you've got an activity that's not a predecessor, meaning that it doesn't have to be done before something else, that means it's going to come together at the finish. This is going to be a little bit more clear once I do start drawing them. Now, the first example I've got for you is an excerpt from a recipe. So it's just um, taken from a recipe. I don't know what it is, maybe a cake or something like that. Um, what we're going to do is just have a go at looking at predecessors. So that's just what activities have to be done before another can begin. It is possible in a project, a project in this case is making this recipe, it is possible you have activities that don't have predecessors. And hopefully by looking at it in practical terms, so in terms of a recipe, it will make more sense. So first one here is collect ingredients. Now I'm thinking, well, there's nothing really that needs to be done, um, not from this list anyway, before you collect those ingredients. So there is no immediate predecessor. There's nothing that has to be completed before that. Likewise, preheating the oven. Well, you don't need the ingredients to preheat the oven. So really, there's nothing that needs to be done before you do that step either. And most people would even uh, preheat the oven first. They'll flip that on first and you'll see it even says it first in the recipe um, before they collect their ingredients. The next one is to grease the cake tin. Now, this one is going to have a predecessor because you're going to need something to grease the cake tin with, so whether it be butter or oil or whatever it might be. So you're going to have needed to collect your ingredients before you do that. So what I've done is I've listed A as a predecessor. That means immediately prior to greasing the cake tin, you need to have collected your ingredients. Likewise, if we have a look at D, beating the butter, sugar and vanilla, we can't do that until, again, 
we've collected the ingredients. So once we've done this, so obviously C and D, they can be done at different times and that they're not going to be predecessors of each other. We continue through this activity precedence table. We have a look at each activity and decide what has to have been done before it. You see that adding the eggs to this mixture here is what happens next. So to do E, you need to have completed the beating of the butter, sugar and vanilla. So its predecessor is D. Now notice that to do D, you needed to do A. To do E, you needed to have done D. Now, what I mean by that is we're not actually going to list A as a predecessor as well. We're only going to list the things that come immediately before it. So not everything that comes before it, just the ones immediately before. Otherwise, what's going to happen is this table is going to get really chockers. It's going to get really full because you're going to be repeating A for everything that comes after um, D and E, which is going to be annoying. So just things that come immediately after it. So with um, F, for example, you're sifting the flour and the salt. You're doing that in a different bowl. So you don't actually need to have done the beating of the butter, sugar and vanilla or adding the eggs. Really, the only thing that needed to have been done is you needed your ingredients. For G, we're adding those two mixtures together. So I'm going to need to make sure that first mixture with the eggs is done. That's E. And the sifting of the flour and the salt, that also needs to be done. So E and F are immediate predecessors of adding um, those two together. So you're adding the flour to the butter mixture with the milk. Uh, once we've done that, we're going to spoon the mixture into the cake tin. So obviously you need that mixture, so that would be G. But also you need that, that cake tin to be greased. So C has to be done at that point and G has to be done at that point, C and G. Baking requires the oven to have been preheated, so B is a predecessor, and the mixture needs to be in the cake tin, so H is also a predecessor. Now obviously these questions are never going to take you this long, this is just a longer one because I'm trying to demonstrate why things are predecessors for others, and hopefully we've all done some cooking before and we're all aware of how a recipe or how baking a cake might work. Removing from the oven, obviously we require it to be baked before we remove it. So the only predecessor would be I, or immediate predecessor. Generally, you're going to be given a table that we've just completed, um, or you're going to be given a network that you then get these predecessors from. So generally, getting the predecessors, filling them in a table will actually be a lot easier than what I've just done. So we've got a list of predecessors. Um, what we want to be able to do is draw a diagraph that represents this. So these can be a little challenging at times. So what I recommend you do is you have a grey lead and an eraser with you at all times with this because what you're going to see is a lot of the time you're going to draw an edge and you might need to move it or you might need to extend it. This happens to me as well as I'm drawing them. So I, I don't know exactly what the network's going to look at look like. Just looking at the table, I sort of start piecing it together as I draw it. And you're going to see why that's necessary in a moment. So a grey lead and an eraser to do this. Okay, so we are going to have a start vertex. Start at the far left of your page. So we'll mark a vertex in there and I'm just going to write start down like this just so that the label doesn't get in the way. What you're going to do is you're going to have a look at your table and have a look at anything that doesn't have a predecessor. So you see I marked it on as a little dash. See how A and B don't have a predecessor. That means that A and B are going to come from the starting vertex. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write, okay, A is going up that way, B is going to go down here. Now I haven't put arrows on yet because I might actually need to change this. So I'm not sure yet whether they end there or whether they need to connect to something else. So just leave as is. with That's, that's just what we're going to do to begin with. I'm going to start working down the list. So now I've done A and B, have a look at C. C needs A to be done. Now what that means is if A is finished here, where this vertex is, I've just inserted that, C is going to come after that. So I need to now put in C. Again, I'm just going to put a line. It may finish there. It might need to extend and, and link to something else. 
D is the same. D also requires A to be done. So I'm going to put D in here. We'll continue. E is where we're up to now. E requires D. So we're going to finish D. So we know E comes after it. And I'm just going to put it like this. So if you want, you can um, tick them off as you go. Sometimes that's helpful so you can see where you're up to. Um, now I'm up to F. Now what does F require? Just A. So F is actually coming from A as well. So all the way back here. Just going to draw it like that. So notice we're just drawing them so that they're headed towards the finish, which is going to be up this other end. All right, F's done. G. Have a look at G. We have predecessors of E and F. That means that both of them have to be completed. So what I'm going to do is F, which I had here, I'm just going to bring it around. That's the same edge, just there. Um, try not to make it look like two separate edges. Mine does a little bit at the moment. We'll just fix that. So E and F, when they finish, when both of them are finished, G can begin. Like so. Okay, so G's in. H requires both C and G to be finished. So C is sitting back here. G's over there. G's going to end here where the vertex is. Let's extend C around so that it finishes at the same time. Okay, so again, I'm just making this less pointy because I don't want it to look like there's a vertex in between. There we go. So C goes around here. G goes to there. H can begin after they are completed. Okay. I. Now I needs H to be finished. So let's finish H. But I also requires B. Now B was sitting all the way back here. So what I'm going to do is make sure B comes across up to here uh, where H is. So B and H are both going to finish, meaning that I can begin. Now, if we have a look at the final one, J, we need I to be completed. So J is going to be here. Once you've drawn all of them in, we know that we've reached our finish. So that is the order that everything must be done. As you can see, some things can be happening while others are happening. A perfect example of that is the oven being preheated. You turn it on right at the start, but we don't actually need it to be ready until all the way down here when we're ready to bake. So these activities up here, A, C, D, E, F, and G, they're all going to be happening while the oven is preheating. So that is our first activity network that we've drawn. Obviously, we will do a little bit of practice with this. So just over the page, we have got an activity network that is already drawn for us. Now, what you'll notice is not only do we have a letter, but we've also got a number next to each um, label. The other thing I'll mention, because I did mention before that the act, it was the edges that represent the activities, that means that the labels you'll see are on the edges, not on the vertices. So we're not going to have a label on, so this A4 is not going to be on the vertex, it is on the edge. I'll just take that out. So the numbers I was mentioning, they are representing the duration of the particular activity. It's telling us how long does it take for that activity to be completed. So we're going to fill out two things, the predecessor and the duration of each activity. Have a look at activity A. There is no predecessor. Nothing has to be done before A. So we put a little dash. Its duration is four. Now, often there'll be a unit, so four minutes, four hours, four days, etc. Okay, so B. What has to be completed before B? Well, if you have a look, the thing that's finishing when B starts is A. So it needs that to be finished before it can begin. C is the same. It just needs A to be done, as is D. So these three activities here, B, C and D, all need A to be done first. C has got a duration of 6. D has a duration of 5. Let's have a look at E. 
what is finishing as E starts? So this is the start point of E and the finish point of B. So E requires B to be done. That's going to happen in 4. Up to F. Again, just have a look at what's finishing here, not what's starting. What's finishing is E. There are other things at that vertex, so you'll notice G and H, but they're starting at the same time as F, so they are not predecessors. Only E is a predecessor of F. F happens in 1. Okay, G, also E, and H, also E. So I've done that exactly the same way, so 7 and 3 for those respectively. I, have a look at I, H is finishing when I begins. And two, J, well, we've got two things here. C is finishing and F is finishing when J begins. C, comma, F, and that's in six. And finally, K, there's actually four things finishing before K. We've got D, we've got J, I, and G. So D, G, I, and J, they are all predecessors. And K happens in 4. So that is a completed predecessor and duration table. Okay, before the end of this video, I'm just going to draw a couple more digraphs for you before we cover something called a dummy. Um, with these two, they're uh, reasonably small. And of course, if we were to give you one to draw, we're not going to give you a crazy one um, that, that's going to take you half an hour to do. That would never happen. If we are asking you to draw one, it will be reasonable. But secondly, um, the point I'll make is often with your, your exam, you're not going to be asked to draw a full network. Generally, you'd be asked to add a missing edge to your network. So all of what we're doing here is very much applicable, not just to your um, SAC assessment, but also for your exam. All right, starting vertex. I'm just going to put it down like this so that I've got uh, more space. <clears throat> Let's have a look. J doesn't have a predecessor. So J is coming from the start vertex. I'm going to leave a space and add the durations at the end. K requires J to be finished. But if we have a look down this list, there's actually three activities, K, L, M, and M. So I'm going to spread them out a little bit so they don't get, so there's no crossover, I guess. So I've got enough space. So K needs J to be finished. So does L and so does M. I'll leave a little space next to it so you can put the number later. All right, N needs K. So N is going to start after K is finished. Just put it like that for now. O needs L, so O is going to come after L. And if we have a look here, P, M, N, and O. So all of these here need to be finished. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just fix this up a bit so that it goes to the same place. See what I mean about using an eraser? It's very helpful when you're drawing these. So that one's going to go around to there. So M, N, and O, once they're done, P can start. And that's all of them. So then we'll put finish over here. I probably didn't need to start so far over to the left, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Let's put the durations in. So J, comma, 25. K, comma, 40. Notice how we put the notation or the correct notation for this. Um, o is 10. L, I'm just going to move that over a bit because it's a bit too squishy. L is 20. M, 35. And P is 15. Okay, and there's our completed activity network for that table given on the left there. I'll do one more and then finish up with this video because this is just basic drawing of our networks. In a second video, I'm going to go through dummy activities, which is very important when we're drawing these. Okay, so start vertex. 
I'll just put ST this time. We know what that means. Um, all right, what doesn't have a predecessor A and B? So let's start off with them. A and B across there. C needs A to be done. So let's finish A and start C. What are we at now? So A, B and C are done. Tick them off if you like. D needs A as well. So this is going to get a bit squishy. D. You ever need to just rub it out and move things around? Of course, that's what you do. You can see that's what I'm doing as well. Now, E requires B and C. Oh, well, perfect example of where this is going to be needed. See how I need B and C to meet together at the same vertex and D is in the way at the moment. I don't want to do this. I don't want to join them up. I don't want to have any crossover here. I don't want them to be, oh, I essentially want them to be planar graphs. So I don't want any overlap. So to get around this, what I'll do is C and D both have to come from A. If I just switch this around and put D up there and put C down there instead, they still both come from A but now I can get B and C meeting at the same spot. I need that because E is going to come from the end of those two activities. So we've done that one. F requires D, so F is going to come after this one. So F. And, oh, if we have a look here, E and F. So you can actually be a bit smarter about this and draw or look ahead before you draw it in. Probably should have done that myself. So E and F are going to meet at the same place. There we go. Uh, G. G is happening after E and F. So we'll put that in. Alright, now we're down to H. Now you notice H doesn't have a predecessor. So what that means is, seeing as G, see G, ha G is not listed in the predecessor column, that means G must go to the finish. So what do we do about H? H doesn't have a predecessor, just like A and B. That means that it starts all the way back here at the starting vertex. H is also not a predecessor of anything else, so nothing comes after it. So H actually does this. It starts here and goes all the way to the finish. So now that we've done that, of course, we don't have the duration, so we're going to put them in. You just need to put a comma and then the duration which is listed. Keep it nice and neat and clear where you can. Um, it's obviously a little bit tricky as you're doing it, um, but you can neaten anything up at the end. You just want it to be clear enough that you will be able to read those numbers clearly and you'll see which um, edge is which, so the labels are clear enough. Make sure everything has an arrow on it as well. It is directed. You must have those arrows on there. Um, that is telling you what is a predecessor to something else. So you're going to be following those paths once we start to do critical path analysis. I'm going to stop there with this video um, and you can do a little bit of practice with these. Um, once you're ready, once you have done some practice, you'll watch the next video in regards to dummy activities. So thank you very much for watching this video.